one second yes okay so now we are recording so Matthias here you are so um, I will go to full screen so the question is that if you have questions just um, just unmute yourself if possible and say something that is way more convenient I mean Antony already promised to say something if there are questions on via the chat. So for people that only have access to the chat, that's also possible. But I think it's easier if you just interrupt, because I might not be able to see. So uh, this is joint work with Jean Daniel Boissonnard, and um, uh, the implementation has been done um, oh, mainly uh... by our uh, PhD student Sergei Kashinovich. And well, I mean, so it's mainly about. Um, work which about the topologically correctness uh, algor uh, of the algorithm which was our work but when i i come to the involvement of our phd students i will will indicate that so um, let me start by uh, the definition of isomanifolds i presume that everybody is familiar with isosurfaces um, where you have a surface in r3 that is given as the zero set of a function. Uh, yeah, I mean, clearly the simplest example of that is the sphere and everybody is uh, familiar with that. But this uh, simple definition extends to arbitrary dimension and co-dimension. So in this case, you've got a function from Rd to Rd minus n, and you look at the zero set, and assuming that zero is a regular value of that function, then the zero set will be a manifold. Just to stress, I mean, uh, throughout the presentation, D will be the uh, ambient dimension and N will be the intrinsic dimension of the uh, manifold. Um, just to recall, we, uh, um, zero is a regular value of F. If at every point X such that F of X is zero, the Jacobian or matrix of first derivative of F is non-degenerate. And well, the goal of isosurfacing is to find a piecewise linear function such that um, the zero set um, of this function is a good approximation of the um, zero set of the original function. And, wait a second, defining such piecewise linear functions is not that difficult. So the idea is the following. So you take some ambient triangulation of Rd, and then you want to define the, func uh, the function by looking at the function values at the vertices at first. So you just copy the, the value at the vertices, and then for every simplex inside your triangulation of Rd, you uh, take F the PL, which is this linear interpolation, to be the just the linear interpolation on, uh, on each simplex. So in here you see this simple example of the uh, of a parabola and um, its piecewise linear approximation. So that is easy, but let me note that this is something um, um, that isomanifolds are quite particular. So not every manifold can be written as a zero set of a function. Locally, of course, this is possible because of the implicit function theorem. But globally, that is not the case because there exists something like a uh, well, there exist manifolds that are uh, have a non-trivializable normal bundle. Examples are, for example, uh, projective spaces, Klein bottles, and the Möbius band. Of course, here you see on the left the Möbius band and the Klein bottle on the right. And well, of course, the one on the right is not properly embedded, and uh, but uh, and the one on the left has uh, has a boundary. But anyway, these. Um, have non-trivial, uh, non-trivial or non-trivializable normal bundle, and that makes uh, that you cannot write them as a zero set of function. So we're we're interested in a particular subset, but an interesting subset. And well, of course, as I said, you, I mean this construction depends on this ambient triangulation, and we need to choose something for that. And it turns out that uh, well. Choosing a Coxeter triangulation is a very good choice because Coxeter triangulations are very nice triangulations in the sense that every simplex is um, well shaped. And so let me uh, recall a definition. 
a monohedral triangulation is called the triangulation if all its simplices can be obtained by consecutive reflection through all its facets. So, for example, if you would take this simplex over, wait a second, I need to change color. If you would take this simplex over here, then you can reflect in this face to get that triangle, and then you can reflect in that face to get that triangle, and so and so on and so forth. And if a triangulation uh, can be constructed as such by these reflections, and if it's a hyperplane arrangement, then it's a Cox triangulation. So as said, uh, all Cox triangulations have wonderful quality, by, me, by which we mean that these simplices are well shaped. Well, I mean, if to be entirely precise, uh, we say that if a simplex is well shaped, if its volume over the longest edge length to the power dimension is large, or if the um, uh, smallest altitude over the uh, longest edge length is large. But one of these um, families of uh, triangulations, namely the uh, triangulation family of uh, type A tilde, is particularly nice because it's in fact a Delaunay triangulation and it's a very nice uh, so-called uh, Delaunay protect, uh, a protected Delaunay triangulation, meaning that if you perturb the uh, points a tiny bit, so if you would put, take the perturb the uh, points a tiny bit, not much, but then if you take the, the Delaunay triangulation of the perturb point set, then you would still get a, um, triangula a triangulation of the manifold with the same combinatorial structure. And there are, exist very nice um, operations on um, on um, these uh, coxal triangulations, and for this we refer to our recent sausage paper and the PhD thesis of Sergei. And uh, well, having uh, given the definition at least of the precise linear approximation, I will go through a a rather subjective history of triangulating. We we have a we have had a lag, like uh, you, I think you can. Can you still hear me? At... Oh yes. yes. Okay. Yes. Sorry, Matthias. There has been a lag. Can you just uh, be, uh, begin again at uh, a subjective history? Because. Oh yeah. Sorry, I was struggling with the. So I was just saying that I would start with the the subjective history of this these triangulations and then i found out that it was also i also had technical issues i don't know understand okay. what was going wrong okay you now i think we, we are good all there right there's been some uh, some issue but for me we are good all right okay you are now muted so um so i will start with a, a i mean so this is a history of a general history of triangulating and isosurfacing and so I will start my history, well, almost in the middle with Whitney. So he gave a constructive proof of triangulating, uh, sorry, the, he gave a constructive proof of the fact that any smooth manifold can be triangulated. The, this was not the first proof. This was, uh, the first proof was due to Kearns and way earlier, but this one is the first really truly geometrical proof and it uses um, ambient triangulation. So the trick is that um, uh, Whitney um, basically only triangulated submanifolds of RD, and, but he used his own Whitney embedding theorem to ensure that any smooth manifold has such a uh, embedding. And I will be discussing this mo uh, more in detail yeah. soon because um, uh, together with Jean Agnel and Sergei, uh, I turned this into an algorithm. And so let me now fast forward to the computational geometry. Um, sorry, the uh, more graphics and computational geometry um, um, part of the thing, of the history, which is uh, the introduction of the matching cube algorithm for isosurfaces by L Lawrence and Klein. So 
uh, here you've got not a general manifold like in Whitney's case, but a again a, a surface given as a zero set of a function. And what Lawrence and Klein did was the following. So they said, yeah, I mean, we are going to subdivide our uh, space into small cubes. And for each cube, we will look at the function values at the, of, at the vertices. Well, let's for the, for the moment uh, just agree that um, a, a dot means that there is a positive value and a, a no dot means a negative value. Of course, it's completely interchangeable, but for the sake of the argument. So what they did is they, they produced this lookup table and using this lookup table, they determined what a piecewise linear approximation in every small cube should be. So over here, you see that, um, that for example, if you've got just one vertex on this side, so here, so then you, you this is all positive, and then you insert one simple uh, simplex over here to, to divide the positive part from the negative part. But uh, this works only really well in 3D uh, because, well, you have to use this lookup table, which is to a certain extent efficient, but if you would go to higher dimensions, this lookup table would become exponentially bigger, which is not a very good idea. And, uh, well, even as is, I mean, you you get a lot of uh, topological problems because, well, I mean, you can 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 create all sorts of artifacts using this method, um, and uh, well, that's not good. But slightly later, um, the uh, Algo and Georg did prove that you can get some kind of uh, uh, guarantees, namely guarantees on the gradients and on the one-sided Hausdorff distance. Then the computational geometry community um, got involved in the, the mid-2000s, and so the first uh, 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 proof of topological correctness for isosurfacing was due to Brosnan, uh, Kohensteiner, and Vector, and later on, on by Plantinga and Vector. So the first one is due to is uses Morse theory and the the second one is more or less akin to normal surface theory. And but these two um, don't. So the latter two uh, do not require any perturbation, and that's very good because perturbations generally tend to be expensive. But the fact that it's not the case is not necessarily that surprising because uh, it's um, always possible to triangulate a Riemannian uh, two manifold without requiring um, any perturbations. And for this, I would re uh, like to require uh, to refer to the work of Ramsey Dyer and collaborators and see um, that paper for correction. Well, and then more recently, um, well, I mean, a gr group around uh, Jean-Yel Bossonat and a group around Tamal Day have been getting interested in triangulating manifolds of arbitrary dimension. And that's uh, nice and well, but the problem is that these uh, triangulations generally require heavy perturbation schemes, which are expensive, at so least in... Uh, Matthijs, what do you mean by uh, it does not require perturbation? Uh, so perhaps I I will wait a second. Let me uh, perhaps I will. Answer this later, will be okay. this will clear well perhaps be clearer later on. Okay. Uh, now let me sorry. No, I will try to explain something. So uh, generally slivers are, for general manifolds are pretty bad in arbitrary dimensions. In two dimensions, you can deal with them. Um, for uh, roughly speaking, the reason why you can deal with slivers is because if you've got a in, if you're on, on a Riemannian surface, then you can still know whether you're on one line of a geodesic and on, or another side of a geodesic. In three D, because you do not have something some nice definition like a geodesic, which is two dimensional or higher dimensional. Um, well, lying on the side of three, well, something spanned by three points becomes a bit fuzzy in 3D. And that is something which um, is bad. 
and this doesn't occur in 2D. And so, well, in low dimensions, basically everything which you have to in uh, sorry in for manifolds, generally the thing which you have to do is to remove slivers, which are very poorly shaped simplices. So you know what a um, so does everybody know what a sliver is? Uh, uh, so maybe, maybe you can re recall it. I don't uh, know. Wait a second. It's hard I, to see people. <laughs> uh, so suppose that you've got a a sphere. And you take uh, f four, four points near the equator. These are supposed to be near the equator. I'm not very good at drawing. And well, they're they're all, these is, these two are opposite, and those two are opposite. Then you can find the co convex hull. And then if you take that simplex, that thing is very flat and near the equator, and that is very very bad in general. You can because if you would perturb these points. So, so if you would look at it from, from, let's say that you're on a manifold and then you, you lift this simplex up to the tangent space at some point and you lift it up somewhere else. Then if you, um, if you do that, then uh, because there is a metric distortion via the lifting, then you might get an inversion. And so this, this simplex is no longer uh, the way, the way that it is. And to, to, to prevent that, you need to require that the simplex either is very fat or it's, um, uh, or it's, um, sorry, it needs to be fat or it needs to be thick, which is more or less equivalent. Okay. And so, so, I mean, this, this uh, getting rid of these bad simplices that's uh, called sliver exudition and more or less uh, a lot of these higher dimensional um, and also low dimensional for, for different reasons. And uh, many approaches uh, have to deal with that and that's not entirely easy. So there's also the, uh, so apart from the work on, on manifolds, which have been manifolds without boundary, there's also some work about uh, on uh, uh, surfaces and even stratified spaces in 3D. And this is due to, to well, basically uh, Laurent Renaud, who wrote his PhD thesis at INRIA in, in, in Sofia, and well, his his supervisors, and again a group around uh, Tamil Day. And so, if I may recall, what a stratified space is: a stratified space is a filtration as such, uh, such that the the uh, ith manifold minus the ith minus one, sorry. M i minus M i plus one is a manifold. So basically, you've got manifold-like pieces that stitch together in a reasonably controlled way. And uh, in three D, people have been able to provide algorithms to triangulate those. And but this is restricted to three D. What is not restricted to three D is to work on recognizing these strata. There has been a lot of interest in, in, into that in the community quite uh, recently, and that has been in arbitrary dimension. And so, one of the things which we'll see is that this works also work, work also extends to stratified spaces, um, but in arbitrary dimension. And so uh, now we'll try to recall Whitney's algorithm and uh, well, the, Whitney, uh, the triangulation, which, uh, sorry, the triangulation algorithm, which was based on Whitney's construction, which we did with uh, Sergei. Whoopsie. And now I, there's something wrong. Oh, I have slight technical issues. So yes, uh, can you st still see the screen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, then the technical issues seem to have been resolved. So um, before I, I formulate the result, I would like to recall what a reach is. So because the, um, well, the, the guarantees are, called, uh, are formulated in, uh, in terms of the reach. And so suppose that you're given this, this curve over here, this thick curve, and then you can look at all the points uh, in the ambient space that are do not have a unique closest point, and so for example, this point, this point over here is equidistant to a point over there and a point over there, and so the set of all these points is called the medial axis. There is also something over here which extends to infinity, which I haven't.
um, closed set. And the interesting thing is that this reach bounds both um, uh, local geometry and global geometry, and therefore it's ideal to formulate um, um, constraints in or guarantees in. So what the the algorithm based on Whitney's construction says is the following. So um, you take a n-dimensional uh, smooth manifold in RD with positive reach, and you output a triangulation of that manifold. And it consists of two parts. So let me go to the pictures. Whoopsie, yes. Uh, so can you st still see this? Because I had a lag again. You are yes, now we can. You are All right. You are now so wh what you see in the gray background, there is a the original Coxeter triangulation. And then you want to perturb this, this ambient triangulation such that the D minus N minus one skeleton of the ambient triangulation is far away from the manifold. If that is the case, then the, the intersection between the, each individual simplex in the ambient triangulation and the manifold itself will be a deformed um, polytope. And this deformed polytope can be triangulated with relatively easily go, uh, uh, using barycentric subdivision. And these stitch together nicely. So this is over here, you see, see exactly these points, which are in fact, so you look at these points, which are exactly the points where the, the D minus N faces of the ambient uh, triangulation intersect the n-dimensional manifold. So you, you look at the intersections sections where the, the manifold and the um, and the triangulation meet at, uh, um, sorry the intersections of the uh, faces of co uh, of dimension equal to the co dimension of the manifold. And so if you take these so you take these points and then by barycentric var subdivision you get this point in the middle and this gives you a triangulation of well this deformed polytope. And then you do that for every inside every of these simplices. So you've got a triangulation over here and a triangulation over there. And these two, by construction, uh, stitch together nicely. And this is the, the algorithm of uh, Whitney. And the hard part is proving that this thing is correct. Now let me try to discuss some uh, preliminaries. So I will try to recall the implicit f function theorem. So the implicit function theorem says the following. So suppose you're given f, which is a function of d plus one to uh, r d plus one to r d minus n, and that function is continuously differentiable. Then you can split this function into, or sorry, you can split r d into r d uh, r n plus one and r d minus n. And well, you write the coordinates uh, accordingly. So you can write them as x comma y, where the x refers to the first one and y to the second part of the, uh, the space. And suppose that you have a point a comma b such that f of a comma b equals zero. If the Jacobian with respect to y is invertible, then there exists an open neighborhood in our n plus one, such that you can basically write um, this, uh, write a, the or the solution set can be written as a differentiable function g in the small neighborhood, so that you have that f of x of g of x equals zero for all x in this small neighborhood. And now. Um, it turns out that you can, so here we assume that this function is differentiable and it turns out that the implicit function theorem extends to the setting where the function is no longer differentiable, but just Lipschitz. So let me recall the definition of a Lipschitz function. A function is Lipschitz if the difference between f of x and f of y, so the norm of that, is less or equal than k times the norm of x minus y. Uh, the easiest example of a Lipschitz function is the absolute value of x. We note that, of course, all C1 functions are Lipschitz, but not all Lipschitz function, uh, but not all Lipschitz functions 
are differentiable, but it is true that um, every Lipschitz function is uh, differentiable almost everywhere. And now I have to check the time because I yeah, okay, think you have... Let's see. No, no, no. I, I think I ca cannot continue with the exp so there is an entire theory about the uh, how to to do the implicit function theorem um, for um, for uh, ellipsoid functions, but I don't think I can I have time to recall these these um, results in detail. Okay. So let me. It's nice if if there if in the end I I've got plenty of time left and I will will discuss that, but let me now go. So the important thing is to know is that there is an implicit function theorem and there is a Lipschitz variant of that, and the other thing main ingredient for the the proof of MOS theory. And so I will be um, I will be giving a entire screen allow. So hopefully you will see the. Um, we, we see your wall screen here we are we see your yeah. animation yeah so you you see you see the standard example for most theory and so the idea of most theory is the following so uh, if you you follow these these um, horizontal slices then the topology doesn't change until until you reach a point where this this horizontal plane is tangent so or rather and to put it in a different way, you if you can just follow the gradient flow of the um, uh, gradient flow of the height function, and that will induce you a diffeomorphism onto to the uh, onto the level sets, and that is the thing which we will be using. So, so I I play my my part and I I transfer to you that your animation is very nice. So say by Raphael and maybe. Uh, and maybe Fabrice Rouillet. <laughs> Thanks. The chat, they are writing the chat. <laughs> Thanks a lot. So the thing which you need to know is that you've got this this gradient flow, and that gives you a piecewise. Um, it gives you a, a homeomorphism, and in fact a diffeomorphism. But if you have a piecewise, so. The, the standard version is with a smooth gradient field, but if you have a piecewise smooth gradient field, you you no longer have a diffeomorphism, but you still have a homeomorphism, and that's not not difficult to check if you know the proof. Well, because that is just by taking the um, uh, Lindorf um, proof of the existence of the uh, assertion of differentiable uh, 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 of uh, differential equations. And so now let me go through the thing which we have proved now that we have all the techniques. And so um, now I will need to, to, well, of course, we need to have some, we want to look at the zero set of function, but this function has to be reasonable in one way or another. And well, in fact, in many ways. Uh, so what we, we need is that the gradient of the function doesn't behave too, too wildly. So for this, We've got a quantity called gamma zero. Then we've got to have that the Hessian, so the, the second order derivatives, do not um, behave too wildly, which is this alpha max. And then, as I uh, recalled in the beginning, you need to have that uh, that zero is a regular value. And well, one of the ways to to enforce that zero is a regular value, or to determine how regular something is is by taking um, b taking the smallest um, eigenvalue of the gram matrix. So for example, if you would have two, two gradient fields that would, would, so you want to have the gradient fields of the different uh, components of the functions are like this. If they are like that, you don't no, no longer know whether the function, or it's not easy to determine whether the, long, uh, the, manif uh, the zero set of the function is in fact, um, a manifold of the right dimension. So there is this um, important quantity lambda zero, which uh, basically says how uh, regular the regular value is. And so uh, that is that. And so you are now muted. We need also need some simple results, which basically says that if you you have a good quality ambient triangulation. And um, 
uh, and you have a bound on the size of the longest edge length, then the function values of a, a linear um, uh, a linear approximation to a function and the function itself are close and also its gradients are close. So this t, this is the t which is the quality, it defines the thickness or the quality of the simplices and d is the longest edge length of these simplices, the capital D. The small, the, uh, small d is of course the, dimension, the ambient dimension. And now the result says that, so if the the manifold or the functions are sufficiently regular, then um, um, uh, wait a second. So if the, the function is sufficiently regular and there is some transversality condition which is satisfied, then the zero set of the function is in fact a manifold which is isotopic, so more than ju not just homeomorphic, but in fact isotopic to the zero set of the original function, and uh, it's easy to to you are now to enforce these conditions because you can just make the the triangulation tri triangulation denser and denser. It doesn't require any perturbation or anything. So this t. This require, I mean, this T, this is a, a quality measure of the ambient triangulation. So, uh, sorry, the ambient simplices. It's not a quality measure on the simplices in the output. And that is really important. Matej, uh, uh, yeah? I, I have a question from Josué uh, asking if lambda would be the square of the least singular value of nabla. Lambda mean. Uh, so, um, um, Lambda, sorry, to go back. So lambda min, that was the, uh, so you, you look at the singular values of the, the Hessian, which is more convenient. Okay. Uh, wait a second, where was it? This is, I thought I had it. Oh yes, yeah, here. So lambda min is the smallest eigen, absolute, whoopsie, that is not very good. Um, uh, so lambda min is the smallest absolute value of the eigenvalues of the gram matrix. So you need to, it might be that, uh, that I mean, these, these eigenvalues are, uh, wait a second, are they all positive? Yes, they are all positive, but you need to set the smallest one. So, the, uh, so Guillaume is saying it, it should be also the... Uh, Maybe the square of the least singular value of the Jacobian matrix. The the Gram matrix is uh, the symmetri symmetrize of the Jacobian matrix. No. Oh yes, yeah, yes, yes, yes. Sorry, yes, it's the smallest. Yes, the square root of the smallest. Thing. Yes, sorry. Okay. Yeah, it's 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 indeed like that. Yes, yeah, sorry. Okay, so we we all agree. I think. Yes, we all agree. <laughs> so wait a second. Where were we? Um, where is the proof now? Oh, sorry, it's the first key. <laughs> now I got confused. It's first key results and then the proof. Um, so there is also a result. No, oh, this is strange. This is, well, somehow this got sh shuffled. I don't know. Uh, so the proof goes as, as follows. So what you, you see over here, I will go to zoomed in version. I will go to the zoomed in version. So over here you see um, an interpolation between the smooth and the, the piecewise linear. So over here you see, hopefully if you look very closely, that this is um, piecewise linear over here. And over here you've got a, a, a smooth. And now the thing which you want to do is you want to, to use MOS theory to... So I will introduce a, a parameter tau and you want to use most theory to, to flow from, from the bottom to the top. So um, in formula that is, so you take this FPL, which is this interpolation, linear interpolation between the, the, func the original function which you're given and its piecewise linear approximation. And you, you, you go, I mean, the picture that is the interpolation which goes like that. And so what you need to, to prove to be able to, to apply that is to, to have that the gradient is a, 
the gradient flow on this. So you want to to have that you you want to use the gradient flow on this manifold, which is the zero set on this picture. Mm -hmm. And for uh, to use the the gradient flow, you need to first establish that this thing, this thing over here, is a, a piecewise smooth manifold. And so first you look inside. Well, basically the the inside each simplex, but well inside each simplex times the interval, and you use the implicit function theorem to determine that inside uh, each of these things, this zero set, so the zero set of this interpolating function is a, is a smooth function, is a smooth manifold. Then you have to basically fix the transition from one simplex to the other. And for that, you use the non-smooth implicit function theorem to prove that, so this version which I, for Lipschitz functions, because these functions are still Lipschitz. And with that, you prove that the zero set is a manifold, but not smooth. So with these two, You've proven that this thing, this in, this yellow uh, yellow object which I drew, is a, a piecewise smooth manifold. And then the you can flow follow the gradient flow of the time which goes upwards. And if that gradient flow is never horizontal, then you've got a homeomorphism thanks to Morse theory. Mm -hmm. And so this is the the idea of the proof. And well especially proving that um, that is i mean proving the first two points is really technically quite hard and i won't be giving the details about how to prove that it's really an exercise in in matrix calculations and in this implicit function theorem but i mean so if you have that then the gradient um, um the diffeomorphism is pretty easy to construct and so here again, so it's important to 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 see, even if it's not super clear, that below it's smooth, on top it's piecewise linear, and the gradient flow gets you there. And in fact, because you you've got a bound on uh, well the angle between the the in well the angle between the gradient on side on the manifold and the vertical direction, which is the tau direction in there, this even gives you a, a bound on the Fréchet distance because this gradient flow, in fact, gives you the isotopy and the, the you can estimate the angle. And from that, you can find that the, uh, the Fréchet distance between the two sets is pretty small. So by a Fréchet distance between two manifolds, I mean the, the smallest so you take two manifolds that are embedded in RD, and you look at uh, all homeomorphisms between each other. And be sorry, between the two. Uh, sorry, you take a pair of. I'm not uh, um, being clear. So I'm. Um, you take a pair of two embedded manifolds in RD. Then you look at all diffeomorphisms or homeomorphisms between the two. And then you look at the the maximal distance between the um, a point in its image under the homeomorphism. The Fréchet distance is the smallest. Um, uh, the sm uh, so it's the the um, infimum over the supremum of this distance. And the infimum goes over all homeomorphisms, and the infimum goes over all points on the manifold. The interesting thing is that this proof even goes through for manifolds with boundary. And so I hope that, well, let me recap what bump functions are. So bump functions are really easy. So they're, they're smooth, they're one in a place where you want them to be one, and they're zero uh, away from that place. And they're, they're infinitely differentiable. And so just as a manifold was defined as a zero set, you can also define a, man a manifold with boundary as a zero set. And so in this case, you would need to, to build exactly the piecewise linear approximation of the f as before, and to take a piecewise linear approximation of this boundary function, which defines the boundary in the same way as before. And then you get, well, 
again, the piecewise linear approximation of the, the manifold with boundary. But the question again is, is this correct? And this is um, slightly, more, well, a lot more subtle. And um, the proof, in, in fact, um, consists of two parts. So first, First, you need to bound. Uh, you need to build an isotopy uh, between, well, this thing, and so this over here. Oopsie, this is not very well drawn, but this is the boundary which you're inter interested in, and then you look at a tubular neighborhood um, around that boundary with all these. Oh, oh, this is not good. So I need to draw slower. So you've got basically a a nicely foliated uh, neighborhood of your your boundary and first using these bump functions more or less in the same way as before you you deform everything which is away from the boundary into its piecewise linear uh, approximation just as in the construction with this tube, which we've seen before, which went from the circle to its piecewise linear approximation. And then, so then you take basically every line here in the neighborhood of this, of this boundary, and for each of them individually, you, you deform them into its piecewise linear approximation using again the same techniques but slightly more complicated as before so you deform first the uh, yes you have said that individually you you deform them but you, you have to you imply that uh, the the result will be coherent yes okay yes um is that easy to see yeah yeah, no, sorry, it's not entirely trivial to see, but if you write it down, it's it's it follows. Okay. Yeah, I mean, so that is the the main difference. Um, uh, so the, uh, you would expect that you could use the, just uh, just deform the boundary, um, just deform the boundary in a nice way. And uh, well, basically, just slice up your manifold in a nice way. But you you cannot. So so the fact that you need these two steps. Oh, whoopsie. The fact that you need these two steps is rather essential because you 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 do not know whether whether your gradients, which are non-degenerate over here, and the gradients along the boundary are non-degenerate over there. But you do not know whether if you would extend this boundary all the way through to here, mm -hmm. then you, you may end up with non-degeneracies, which are, are, well, basically unavoidable. Okay. And so therefore you need to do it in two steps. And this is the reason why you, 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 you slice this up. And yeah, I mean, the fact that it's, um, the fact that it's co coherent, it's um, not entirely, yeah, I mean, it, it. If you write it down, it you would see it, but it's it's not entirely trivial to see. Okay. And so, again, you you can um, you have that this these two zero sets, the, the piecewise linear approximation and the the original zero set, are homeomorphic if um, you you choose the edge length of the ambient triangulation small enough. And even the isotopy, uh, sorry, the Fouché distance between the two is bounded again. And that is pretty neat. But I mean, so this method about doing this induction on the, the, uh, on the dimension and then taking basically strata of lower and lower dimension, uh, that um, that doesn't necessarily, I mean, so, so there's no reason why that shouldn't extend to to arbitrary dimension, so, and more complicated spaces. So, for example, if you would want to triangulate this part of the sphere over here, then you can, can basically use exactly the same techniques, except that 
so you need some bound functions uh, function around here you need some bound function around here you need some bound function around here and you need bound functions around here and so using in theory at the very least um, this proof techniques um, need works perfectly um, for for nasty spaces so in this case a, a manifold with a piecewise smooth boundary, but you can even imagine more complicated spaces like that. But the problem is that uh, you need to add a lot of um, bump functions to get the proof right. And it, I mean, so the proof for the manifold with boundary case was already like 30 pages or so. So we never um, wrote down the manifold with bound, uh, the proof for the manifolds with boundary. But um, in principle, with piecewise like smooth boundary, but in principle, you can do it. Okay. And I thought it would be important for you to know that. And uh, well, now I will will end with some some well, with some eye candy. And so this was the algorithm. So the the, the algorithm was uh, implemented by Sergey, and um, he he. Um, um, so the, the core of the um, idea behind this algorithm was that you you use this Coxer triangulation to move very um, cleverly on the in the ambient space, and in fact you can do that in pretty high dimension. So uh, Sergey managed to triangulate the flat torus in or the um, Clifford torus in R uh, R ten. So what he did is he he took the Clifford torus or flat torus, and then took a random rotation and tried translation into um, R10, then triangulated it in R10, and then projected the, the resulting thing down. And this works. So for us, uh, 10 dimensions is pretty high. And um, also in this case, he, he had this, this flat torus or, um, or Clifford torus in R D, and in this case, he did with a boundary, and um, so these are the intersections of a flat torus with a, ball, a four ball, and in two uh, D. So for surface, well, in fact, for surfaces in four um, D, Sergey even implemented the following. So he he took um, um, he triangulated these surfaces with P phi smooth boundary. And these are part of a uh, projective variety, and this was uh, this was on request by Aurélien Alvarez, who's studying these uh, surfaces, and he could use them to to verify experimentally some of his conjectures at the very least. And um, so then I come to the the take home message, and the take home message is is that. Um, you can have the zero set of the function and the piecewise linear approximation. Um, these two things are homeomorphic if you uh, take the ambient triangulation fine enough, and this ambient triangulation is not too uh, too badly chosen. So if you would let the quality of the simplicity in the ambient triangulation go to zero, then of course you you you're in pro uh, you're in pro uh, trouble. But you can always make a a triangulation denser and denser without um, making the quality worse. Then the Fréchet distance is also bounded, and these results extend to manifolds with boundary, and in theory could be extended without too much trouble to manifolds with piecewise smooth boundary or well, even more complicated spaces as uh, spaces as long as it, they're defined by zero sets of functions. And with that, um, I would like to ask people for questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So if you have a question, you can just uh, open your mic or you, you can write it down. I, I, I see that Guillaume is writing because he has no microphone, I think. So, uh, so it begins with thank you. <laughs> maybe, maybe Matthias, it would be nice for this part to, to go out from full screen so that you can, uh, you can read uh, uh, by yourself. Wait a second, how? How do I do? Oh yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm out of full screen. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. I, I already was because full screen gave some some technical glitches at few at a few ah, points. Okay. 
So you see the, the chat? Yes. Okay. But somehow so maybe, uh, I, I just noticed that your 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 camera is freezing. It's frozen. Did I did I freeze? Yeah. Oh, wait a second. I, I perhaps I my display. Maybe. Uh, so I left my camera and okay. went back and uh, does it start? Okay. It, it started working again. Yeah, yeah it's it, it's okay. So Guillaume, you 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 had a question. Yeah, maybe a uh, so small one about uh, so your your bump function ID. Uh, do you think it would work uh, if uh, the boundary is a point where the the Jacobian matrix is not full rank? So so your lambda min condition is not satisfied, so it will be zero. Uh, but do you think you could still do something? Uh... You, so you use these bump functions to cut these pieces out more or less. So if you use, you're saying you, you can use this bump function to triangulate everything except that piece, yeah, that, that will be possible. But I'm, so if the question, so you need, so for the boundary, you, so let me go to the boundary um, um, picture. Um, so here, so here, of course, you need one gradient, which is the gradient, uh, sorry, the gradient which defines the normal surface, and then there is a gradient which, which defines the manifold. And these th two again have to be, the have to be uh, well, orthogonal to each other, or or at least transversal. And so if you have that, that works. But, and then you can cut it out. But if it if these gradients starts to to go. Well, if these these gradients starts to to become collinear, then of course you're you're in problem in trouble because then the implicit function theorem no longer works. And okay, so, yeah, yeah. I see. so you need still to to have a bound where you okay where you are transverse somehow. Yeah. So you can use it. You can use it to cut it out. So the the thing which I was thinking about is whether you can use it. So if you, for example, have um, these singularities, which come from from um, yeah singularity theory, like uh, the, the work of uh, Arnold, then you know that you can blow up in a higher dimensional space. Then it might be possible, if you know what blow up is, to locally triangulate the the manifold in the low dimensions, then triangulate the uh, the blown up version in the before projection, then project down and see whether you can stitch these things together in a sensible way. But this is an, this is an interesting question and I thought about that, but I don't know the answer yet. I mean, so it, it might be, if you can use, but it, it, will, it will take a lot of creati creativity. It's a, good, it's a good question, I don't know. And I think there's a lot of export, unexplored territory. Yeah, but what you mentioned is very interesting because actually, what I have in mind is uh, some robotic application where indeed we have already a kind of blow up version of the surface. So maybe indeed that's that's an idea to to try to to take yeah, the I mean, boundary from the blow, blown up uh, surface somehow or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, so then you need to to project, you need to project down, and I mean. But then you have to, well, I mean, that, that's a non-trivial exercise. So you need to use the projection to, to re-triangulate more or less. I mean, it's, it's, yeah, non yeah. <laughs> it, it's, yeah. it's definitely one or two papers by themselves. It's, uh, but you can for, I mean, so I think you can use this to, to basically outside the singularity, stitch the, the triangulation, which you had, uh, which you create around the singularity together with this the triangulation, which you find then using this, this as a pretty standard technique. Mm-hmm. Thanks. Okay, are there some other questions? Josué, mm. maybe? Ah, so Josué has a very technical question. Will, will the slides be available somewhere? So for the version of the slides we, we are looking at, you, you can see at the bo left bottom of the slides, 
uh, a download button, a very discreet download button, so you can download this version. And in a few days, Matthias will give me a, a definitive version and uh, I will put it on the website. So, so and together with um, with the video, the recording. So yeah, I, I, I should say that these slides as, as they are, are okay, but I mean, there is a lot of stuff behind um, a lot of a lot of stuff behind the final um, or after the final slide of the presentation, and after that, that's not completely um, up to scratch. Okay, so, so it, it it hope to answer a lot of possible questions, and some of these um, are not completely done. So there there are over thirty slides after after the question slide. I have I have two questions, two technical questions. If I if I am very naive, I give you a function f. Uh, how can you estimate the d, the necessary d? Is this is this a trial and error or no? So so you you've got these bands which are explicit. Um, so you need to cal calculate the Hessian. That is something you need to you need to give bounds on the gradient in the Hessian, and that might not be trivial. Yeah, exactly. How do you do that? Oh, sorry. How how I bound uh, oh, a Hessian? So I, I I need these bounds on the hash. I, I I don't know how to. So so if you give me a function, then then of course you can calculate that. But given no no yeah you can actually in the in examples it's, it is easy to to estimate the the d value to take. Or is it a is it a problem? I, I, I'm yeah. Well, I don't know. We so it's if you have this. So you need to have this alpha max, I think, and this lambda, and this is the. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. I mean, so um, the funny thing is that we had the impression that the the algorithm worked better than what we could prove. Okay. But that because it, it worked quite quickly. So what? Wait a second. Where is the Result. So, but you you have so you have this explicit uh, this this bound on the smallest uh, singular value or the square root of the smallest singular value that is um, that is given explicitly in terms of this, this Hessian and this um, and this uh, gradient bound and the quality of your amb ambient triangulation. So, when you say your your algorithm works better than it's expected. Is that you, you? You have a good result with d with d bigger than uh, than expected, or uh, uh, well, I, I I don't think. Sorry, let me put it like that. I mean, I don't think that d our bound on d is tight. Okay. Okay, and uh, another question is that you have to very often to find the intersection of. Uh, uh, well, the points on the isosurface, which uh, which are in uh, sub simplices of the right dimension. Well, uh, yeah. I, how do you how do you do that? You, you numerically uh, interpolate on the sub simplices, or ah, uh, that now I'm glad that I did make the the extra slide. Oh, this is wonderful. Um, <laughs> uh, so the idea is the following. Uh, so this is a very rough idea of the algorithm. So you take this seed point, yeah. and then you you follow you follow the the manifold uh, along the uh, well. You follow the the ambient triangulation along the manifold, and so these are are simplices of dimension k, which are dimension d minus. Oh, bugger! There's an m. Which should be an n. So okay. this m should be an n. I, uh, this is an n. But anyway, so you you take these these simplices and you follow these, and what you do is you, you, well you need to have a point with uh, start uh, to start with. This is not this is not something which we we handle cleverly or, or more clever than it used to be. But once you have that, then you can look at this Coxeter triangulation and look at its k plus one skeleton. And basically, you march uh, via on this k plus uh, k plus one skeleton by looking at the 
co the for every k phase you look at this k plus one co phases mm -hmm. and then at the k phases of those yeah and so using that you can march pretty efficiently onto the ambient in the ambient translation and so what okay, okay. and then the last step from the 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 march of uh, of simplices to actual points inside simplices yes yeah. yeah so uh, so it depends a bit in theory we need an oracle um it, well for the most general case we need an oracle which says whether a a simplex of dimension equal to the co-dimension intersects a phase or not yeah. but if it's if you can uh, find the point itself that is even nicer because then you get smaller bounds on the uh, uh, Fouché distance or the uh, house of distance between the two. But I mean, so finding the the point of intersection itself for itself for the for, for if you've got a, a outer surface or outer manifold that is just solving a linear equation. So that is uh, the complexity of that is just the complexity of matrix multiplication. Okay, I didn't get why, why it is uh, linear, but uh, okay, we'll, uh, we'll try it's, and understand. So it's, uh, wait a second, how do you see that? Because, um, because at the end I have a, I have a cast simplex, I have a function on that, and I want to, to find the, the unique uh, solution uh, f equals zero. No, no, you should think of it, uh, you've got a k simplex and you've got values at the vertices. And it's just a linear interpolation inside the simplex. So wait a second, let me, can I draw on a blank screen? Yeah, you can, you can, uh, um, oh, okay, you can, but I, I have to do something, sorry, I will take the... Uh, Okay, but I, I, I think I, I got it in the meantime, so it will, okay, and now, okay, you can, you can write. Yeah, so, so I wanted to draw something bigger because otherwise it might be a bit, so you got the values at the vertices and you, you, um, okay. So, so you got it already? Yeah, I got it, but you can, you can, you can. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, so it's, it's basically like that. You, you take the, you, you take the, so basically you, you translate this. So you can translate the, the point for the, uh, because you know that there is exactly one zero, uh, one, um, well, there is, or there isn't a, a point of intersection by assumption. Mm -hmm. We need to some, sorry. That I should have said for the algorithm, unlike for the the proof, I needed to ass assume that the intersection between every simplex of a dimension d minus n n is in fact a single point. This is generically true for um, the piecewise linear functions which you get for isosurfacing, but this is not um, uh, true in general. Okay. And the funny thing is that the homeomorphism proof doesn't need that. So, so there you can have like the you can have like a a n manifold which completely coincides with a phase for for a bit. I mean that's that is is allowed, which is interesting to a certain extent. But so you you can translate more or less all these equations, or you can write these equations in terms of the barycentric coordinates of the of the d minus n simplex which you you want to consider, and then in these these um, and then it's just in these barycentric coordinates, it's just solving these linear equations. Okay, nice. Okay. Um, so, some people had to leave. Maybe you, you can see the, uh, the message. Yeah, yeah. Uh, other... yeah I, the, the data shape seminar was just afterwards. Ah, okay. Afterwards, but usually it's... Uh, the morning.
No, 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 the data ship was now, I... Oh, no, sorry, the speaker is from the United States, I think. Ah, okay. Okay, okay. And are there any other questions? In the audience? And, uh, okay, so the discussion, for, for those maybe who don't know, the discussion began when we asked to Matthias and... Uh, and Jean Daniel, if they, they can uh, triangulate a kind of uh, manifold with uh, angles, so which is a stratified manifold in some sense. Yes. And um, you, what you are you were saying is that any uh, additional strata will will give an additional difficulty in the in the proof because you will have to check by hand. Uh, that you can do things coherently? Uh, not exactly by hand. For, for, so I can prove, I mean, so if you would, would tell me that, I mean, you want to triangulate any manifold with, with four strata, uh, then I can give you a proof for, for any manifold with four strata. Okay, so uh, you, you have a... You have a procedure to, to produce proofs given the number of strata. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, but uh, yeah, so, so, so it wouldn't be, and it, I mean, so if you could go through the details, you would see that basically you, you have this entire, so wait a second, no, I can't go it? back to the, to the slide. So you've got this. You had these bump functions which popped up in your uh, to to basically deform the uh, well first the in, first you bring the piecewise linear interior to a a uh, sorry the interior to a piecewise linear form and then the boundary and then if it would be piecewise smooth boundary you would need to have a stratum which uh, basically a, a, a two bump functions for each of the two strata and then you would take the combination of these two. To which uh, um, these two piece, uh, smooth parts of the boundary where they intersect, they would you would uh, need to to use the combination of these two bump functions to get to cut out that part. But there is no there is no serious problem with doing that. Um, so I mean, if you would go up to the the description of the uh, of the manifold with boundary, just. Yes, this one. So these two, exactly. So you would have this this FPL, mm -hmm. and this would generalize. Instead of having one bump function, you would do this for with two bump functions for each of the two strata. Mm -hmm. So you would have, well, this phi would be then phi one, and then you would have plus a phi two for the other stratum. And then if you would go to the second one, the second slide, well, in fact, you would get, um, you would have this again with two, 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 well, one of them with one function, and then you would have an, a third one with two of these mm -hmm. bump functions. So you would have one which is exactly like this, and then you would have one with phi one comma phi two. And so then you would have, and then the combination you would need to, I think, check something for the boundary points, but I think that that might actually go 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 okay or already uh, for free. But for so for for each of them, you need to to do it, and well, basically, I was more or less exhausted exhausted after writing this proof because it was very very long and very technical. But if somebody would tell me, I mean, we can prove the the uh, the well, we can prove the Riemann hypothesis if we would be able to do this with uh, with five bump functions. I think I would be able to write the, the, down the proof with five bump functions. Okay, but it's yeah. I mean, so the only thing which you and it's it's pretty clear. Perhaps it after you've done the third or the fourth, you see a pattern and you sort of can guess what the the bounds will be. But they yeah. they are a bit how to write uh, it down. Fact. Yeah, I mean because it's. I mean, so uh, there was a reason why I didn't give the give the exact bounds which you find because for the the. 
the manifold without boundary, they are already, well, somewhat complicated, but you can still understand them and you can make sense of them. But these are very, very long expressions already without any, without, uh, um, without, uh, without um, well, with just one boundary. Okay. And so it, I, I think you would, if you would write on the, the, the stuff with uh, two, two strat, uh, strata, I think you would already have bounds which are like, or bounds which you have to satisfy, which are like two or three lines. Okay, you got it. And I have actually uh, another question based on what you showed uh, about the degenerate cases. So let's say you have a triangle and the function is zero on all the three vertices. So first, can it happen? And what do you do in these cases? Uh, so, sorry, a... Uh, I'm not following. So let's say you have a, a bivariate, so in the in the two D case, right? <clears throat> so f of x y equals zero, and let's say that uh, your curve goes through the th three vertices of your of the triangle of your uh, uh, ambient space triangulation. Yeah, wait a second. Yes, that should be okay. Because uh, wait a second, uh, can we go back to? to the the picture where you've got this cylinder st sticking up that should be um, so the proof of the yes uh, one further. yes so here so i think that you're here it doesn't really matter that much um who where the the um so it doesn't matter where exactly you put the, the ambient triangulation in the sense that you could put shift this this ambient triangulation such that exactly the the vertices would be a zero. So these it doesn't matter for the picture, and it doesn't matter for the proof really. So if but you I mean, uh, for a practical point of view, when you compute your piecewise linear function, you mentioned you do interpolation from the value on the vertices, right? Yeah. So, but if the three value are zero, so your interpolation will give you. No, no, no. no. But that cannot happen. Then the gradient is small. So your your uh, then the gradient. I mean, that is definitely not possible. Okay. Okay. So no, hypothesis presents that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, sorry. No, the gradient has to be. Sorry, I'm saying the wrong way around. The gradient has to be sufficiently large. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, because then you have a, but you can have that uh, two vertex uh, vanishes, but then that's okay because your yeah, yeah. your linear function is well defined. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, good. Yeah, sorry. It it should be the gradient. The gradient is lower bounded and not upper bounded. That's that was stupid. Okay. Okay. Other questions? Okay, so maybe let's thank Matisse. Matisse, sorry. Thanks, it was nice. It was very nice, very nice discussion. Um, yeah, and I think that so Jean Agnel is not here most probably because he has to attend the other um, the other talk. But we should have a discussion. I mean, a more technical discussion about the questions which you asked. Yeah, asked I because think I think. Good. But I, I think we're going to wait until the the. Uh, the triangulation in higher dimension is completely done. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and we, then we will uh, organize it, it in, uh, in the Slack space. Yes, excellent. So thank you. Thank you, Matthias. Thank you, everybody, for coming. And uh, okay, next week it, it will be Mohamed Barakat, the comeback. Uh, so see you. See you see next you. week. And Matthias, see you soon. Bye-bye. How do I leave?